Good morning. Welcome to Live with Joan. And we're in our special, special series. So we're in the How to Help Animals. And now we're in this little micro series about wildlife. And the other day we had a wonderful conversation with Linda Tucker about the white lions. And today we are going to have an amazing conversation with Jenny about the orcas. And I will get to that in a moment. Um, so, Claudia, are people coming on? And I know this is an, a funny time, and we've got more funny, not funny, haha, -ha, but uh, a different time than we normally do things. But I wanted to make sure that we really, really got the opportunity to um, look at this microcosm, look and really look deeply into what we can do to help um, animals in the wild. And so, if you're new to me, my name is Joan Ranquet. I'm an animal communicator, author, TEDx speaker, and founder of Communication with All Life University. And our program is for people to learn animal communication or become an animal communicator, to learn energy healing or become an energy healer. And of course, we're opening, we have, we had a meeting yesterday. I'm so excited about our nature and wildlife piece of the school. So we have a whole other part of the school coming together and that's why this series this micro series and the bigger series is so so important to me and um and to the world obviously so um is anyone coming on yes we have um leslie williams tanya hoppe chris wilson People are coming on. okay good good morning everybody and um so you know, one of the ways how to help animals, we've looked through this whole series at sacred activism, how to energetically really utilize money. Um, we've looked at a lot in rescue. We've had a couple of people in the rescue world. And I still say we have a, a call now in the school for um, animals that are in rescues and shelters. So you know, one of the biggest ways we can be helping animals is to be learning animal communication and energy healing. It's just hands down going to help the planet. I always say that the animal communication is the uh, key to world peace because uh, if we were all listening to each other, if we were listening to animals, we'd have to start listening to each other. So uh, we have some wonderful classes coming up. We have the animal communication. Well, we have the uh, intensive, which is April 1st through the 9th, and the first three days uh, is all things animal communication. And then, um, did you want to come up? Oh, all right. Penelope almost joined me. All things animal communication for three days. And then we have three days of EFT, emotional freedom technique, uh, which is something we may be doing on orcas, but uh, yeah, we grabbed a toy. Okay. Um, it's going to get loud. Uh, anyway, um, so it may be something that we can't, we can't do physically on orcas, but an EFT is something we could be doing with emotional lives of certainly animals and sanctuaries. And so then the last three days is animals and sanctuaries. And it's, um, so much fun for sure. We all know we go to the gentle barn and then of course the Gibbon center is down the street. So. There are lots of um, lots of ways in which we can help animals through the spring intensive. And then we have our wonderful fun animal communication level one starting April 27th and that runs for 12 weeks. So if you can't get here or come on to a virtual class for nine days, which is totally understood, then there is the animal communication level one starting April 27th and it runs into June and it's so much fun. It's our found foundational class for the school. And then we have um, energy healing for animals, which is largely more EFT and then also some scalar wave and tons of online content. And that starts May 12th. So there's all sorts of ways for you to step into the role of really helping animals and I also wanted to say, I worked on this last night with um, Dr. Jill, my business partner, Dr. Jill Todd, holistic vet that is uh, of Jill and Joan. Um, 
The last time we lost sound when my phone rang. Did we lose? Let's ask Tanya to chime in. Um, um, <clears throat> let's just wait and see. Hold on, I can I can check. Okay. Anyway, um, we have the most fun acupressure for dogs and cats. We're going to do some horse stuff too. Um, three days after the intensive, so that would be April eleventh, twelfth, and thirteenth, and um, I, we are so excited about that class. I can't even tell you. And I know Tanya's going to be here and there's probably a few other people on the live that are going to be here in person. So just wanted to give a good old fashioned plug for all of that. Um, and today starts five elements. So if you're interested in acupressure, um, you might want to reach out to Shannon at info at joanranquette.com. If you're thinking about the uh, spring intensive, I almost said fall intensive, because that we'll be thinking about that next. Um, if you're thinking about that, then and you're on the fence, or you don't know if you want to come live, we have one live spot left. Um, we do have. Um, well, that's awesome. Went from <coughs> toy to barking. Um, so I don't know what we're barking at, but. Well, they're barking. We actually lost Jenny. Really? Okay. Yeah. I let her know, so we're waiting for her. Ooh. All right. I'll keep talking. I'll keep barking. Um, is anyone here? Uh, yes. Here or at your house that the dogs are barking? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, oh, come on. You want them in your bedroom? No. Who is someone here? No, somebody's walking your dog. Okay. All right. Away. So, um, if uh, um, I would love to actually go back to the spring intensive. Um, we have the virtual part of the spring intensive is so much fun, also, and we have lots of teachers that are online and lots of teachers that are, um obviously here in person. Tanya's going to be here. A few other people are going to be here. So um, Chris is going to be here. Um, and so we have lots of fun. Did Jenny Heidi. get back? We've Heidi's got people saying line. who's going to be there. Yeah. Okay, who's going to be here? Who's going to um, be here? Tanya just says she's very excited about the spring intensive. Heidi uh, Evitz Ensley says she's going to stay for the three days after the intensive. Cool. So, uh, Okay, we've got people coming on. Okay. All right. Is um, Jenny with us? Okay. We're still. Does she, can you explain though why what's where she is and why it's so sketchy the internet? Yeah. So our guest Jenny is from um, the Pacific Northwest. She lives on an island called San Juan Island, and it's internet wonkier than me. You know, I live outside of Hollywood, and you would think that I'd have the best internet. She lives outside of Microsoft World, and you'd think that they would have the best. <laughs> internet, <but> whatever. <laughs> okay, so she's back. Okay. Okay. Um, do you want to go ahead and introduce her? Absolutely. Um, Jenny Atkinson is the executive director of the Whale Museum. Originally from the southern U.S., Jenny has had a lifelong interest in connecting people with nature and wildlife through photography. After vacationing in the San Juans for a dozen years, she moved to the islands in January 2007 to run the Whale Museum. She holds an MLA, MLAS, Master of Liberal Arts in Science from Vanderbilt University, a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Central Florida, and is a graduate of the Institute for Organization Management and the European Folk in Denmark. After working for the First Amendment Center in Nashville, she continues to use her First Amendment right to be a voice for the voiceless, our orcas. Jenny has over 35 years in nonprofit management. That makes me want to cry. And I have a story too. That's amazing that you are a voice for the orcas and that's why you're here. And uh, I wanted to share a little story about um, the whale museum and welcome. Thank you. And my apologies, I don't know if you can, so I'm having to do this on my phone. Uh, living on an island in a rural community, we just lost internet at work. <laughs> so I'm wow. 
trying to get us reconnected. So I've been out to reboot the Wi-Fi and try to reconnect the stream. So I think I'm also back in on the other platform. So I'm going to leave this one. Okay. Yes. And um, hold on. I'll close that one. Technical difficulties. That's okay. Um, I had some l loud barking, so it's we're off to a great start. So I'm hearing some static. Is Who that all has uh, joined us? Okay. I think, Jenny, if you stay on your uh, phone, it's better than the laptop. Oh, no, you're good now. You're good now. But there I'm not go. seeing, so are you able to, is my image showing? There we go. There we are. Okay, so let's fingers crossed that that stays. I am so sorry, Joan. Um, I, if That's I had okay. uh, my communication cords, I could have let you know somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Telepathically. <laughs> yes, I, I could have done something. Um, anyway, so thank you so much for uh, inviting me to to join you. I've been a big fan and appreciator of the work that you do um, through your program, and I'm excited to have a conversation with you today. Thank you. You know, I want to um, share a story. So on my birthday in, I think, 2014 or something like that, I was out with a friend, and it was literally my birthday morning. We were, we knew we were out on a boat up in the San Juan Islands, and we knew that there were whales in the distance because we could see the whale boats out there. And so we just stopped. We didn't know, you know, like where they were. And all of a sudden, a whale came right under it was the best birthday gift ever oh. right under the boat i got a picture of it um got a picture of the eye got a picture of the oh. saddle and so i came running to the whale museum because there i could identify who it oh. was and um that was one of that's how i ended up then taking the course there and i'm a huge fan of the whale museum so oh, i'm really excited you. for you guys for you to be here and represent the whale museum and the orcas. So we'll start a little bit with the whale museum. How did the whale museum come about? So I was not here at the beginning. They started in 1976. I've just been with the museum um, just over 15 years now. But my understanding is there was a research scientist by the name of Michael Big, who was asked by the Canadian governor, um, he's a Canadian researcher, to figure out if there was a way to get a handle on the population numbers of orcas because there was a concern, as is always a human concern, that they were a competition for the fisheries industry and that they were taking too many fish. But uh, before they started killing them all, they wanted to get a handle on how many there were. And he realized, as Joan just shared with us, that you can individually identify these animals on site. And the best markings, because they spend 90% of their time below the surface of the water, and the part that comes up is the dorsal fin and the saddle patch, which sits just behind the dorsal fin um, and it's a grayish marking that is on either side of the animal. And we can use both of those characteristics, the saddle patch and the dorsal fin, for individual identification. What's super cool about a saddle patch is it is different on either side of the animal and is unique to that animal as our thumbprints are to us. Uh, so we have catalogs that we can look at left and right side. Uh, that study, once they realized the success of that, was carried on um, down in the United States waters by the Center for Whale Research. Um, at that time, uh, it was through the Whale Museum, uh, through Ken Balcom. The center started about 10 years later. Uh, but, you know, Ken, Ken took that study and he said, you know, we can do that here. And after a couple of years, researchers were like, we should start telling people this story and figure out a way to keep our work going. It's, you know, by opening a museum and you can collect admissions and help fund your research and education projects. So that's my understanding on how it got started. And it's um, it's just been this very organic beautiful place since to tell the story that um, we're, we were the first and maybe one of the few museums still in the world that's dedicated to a species living in the wild. Uh, for those who don't, don't know, the Southern Resident Community of Orcas is a, is a distinct population segment, meaning that they realize that they don't mix or mingle with any other populations of orcas. Even though we have a number of other ecotypes in this region, they are a closed culture. And so they were listed uh, 2005 in the United States and around that same time in Canada as a species at risk or an endangered population, which then started a number of efforts to try to figure out what was wrong and how to help them recover. And that, that was going to be my next question is, Sorry. Um, 
No, no, no. I want, I <laughs> want to go into the, the JK and L pod. I, yeah. That is like, I've always said that um, I've picked out my family for when I reincarnate. I'm going to yeah. come back as one of them. Yeah. Yeah. They're amazing. What? And you know what's amazing? I love what you were saying before that if we'd all learned to just communicate with animals, we would be a better planet. Um, the, mm -hmm. the thing that's fascinating is orcas are at the top of their food chain. They are amazing predators. They they specialize on food. They don't. They're not generalist in their diet. So southern residents predate on salmon or fish. Um, Transient orcas, which is a different ecotype, look very similar, but they're after marine mammals, and they specialize, and they hunt cooperatively. So we never see signs of aggression within the southern resident community, which is the JKN all parts, the family group that you're referring to. They work together. They travel with their moms all their lives. They help each other raise their calves. Um, and it's a very close-knit family group. They're very tactile. They chat all the time. They're, you know, they're, they're known as a chatty population. Um, so it's just amazing to watch them and to think, you know, you would think that in a, a time of scarcity, which is where we are right now with salmon populations, they're not getting enough to eat, they can't find enough fish, but they're, not, they're still sharing their food with one another. They don't just gobble it down, they go and share it. If there's a mom that's nursing a calf, they don't leave her on her own, they deliver fish to her. It's an amazing population, you're absolutely right. We would be a much more peaceful planet if we would just learn to communicate with them and learn from their example. Yeah, well, it's really beautiful. <clears throat> yeah, I can see over on my iPad that um, Claudia is tearing up, and whenever she does, yeah. then I do. So anyway, it's it. There is such beauty in that JK and the L. And Joan, I just lost your audio. Can you still hear me? And Jenny back. Ta -da. There you are. I can hear you again. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if that was mine that time or not, but boy, I'm just going to apologize all day for technical. This is why we should just be together and be organic. And <laughs> exactly. And I'll tell you, the the location of the Whale Museum is is magical, and the the building itself is beautiful. So. If you're ever in the Seattle area, you've got to go stop by because it is really, it is spectacular. Um, and there's a gift shop. Anyway, um, <laughs> Which is also <laughs> online. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, since we're back and we were interrupted anyways, I have to tell you some super good news. I don't know if you've heard this yet, hmm. uh, but we just got word. So J-Pod uh, visited the region this week. And Haishkwa, which means blessing or thank you in the Samish Indian Nation language, was seen with a calf. So we have a J-59, uh, which is their alphanumeric scientific designation. Uh, there will be a naming process for that baby. Uh, since it's in Samish's line, it will be done with the Samish Indian Nation through a potlatch if they are agreeable to that. Um, but that's been the tradition the last several babies. But we have a super cute new calf. And when I say super cute little guy, we're talking 300 pound baby that you probably don't want to bounce on your knee. 
but looks <laughs> so cute swimming next to mom, you know, this five foot, six foot little baby swimming next yeah. to a 30 foot, 30 foot orca. You have to look close to see the little tiny dorsal. Uh, super sweet. Um, I mean, it's, it's always tempered with tough news. Uh, we have a super high miscarriage and uh, mortality rate with, with newborn calves, uh, but we have one. And so let's celebrate, yeah. let's celebrate that and shore her up with as much uh, compassion and support as we can give to high school and her family group. I love that. I absolutely love that. So how did the JK and L pod, we know that I, I would love to hear the story about granny and mm. how did they become known as the JK and L pod? And okay. um, let's talk about how they came up with their feeding habits. Okay. So let's start with the, the letter. Um, so J pod, K pod and L pod are all member of a family group and it's known as J clan because they're organized acoustically. Acoustics are very important to this, these animals. It's, um, they're, they're mammals just like us, so they have to surface to breathe air, they give live birth, they nurse their young, um, but they need, so while they have good vision, they live in occluded water, so they have to have good hearing to be able to communicate with one another, but also use something called echolocation to map their underwater environment and also find their food source. So uh, fish have a swim bladder that has technically air in it, and when water sound, travels through water and it hits an air pocket, it's going to bounce back and basically give them a mental picture or ring a dinner bell and go, wow, there's a fish over there. I can go get a snack. So as they were, as Mike Biggs started the study, he started recognizing these different clans and family groups. And he started with APOD. So up in the Northern resident community, you start with APOD. Um, and then Ken moves down here. And by then we had gotten to JPOD. Yes, there was an iPod long before Apple came up with it. <laughs> Um, and it's a, it's a family of whales. Um, but so down here we have JK and L. So it's three family group, three family groups within a larger community known as J clan. So they each have their own language. Um, their, I'm sorry, their own dialect within a common language. So it's much like when we speak English, we can travel around the country and we can hear different dialects and different accents. And by twisting our ear, we can understand one another, but we're going to say things a little differently. If it's a different language, you would have to know that language to understand what someone says. So some of your people might understand that in Danish, I just ask if I speak to you in Danish, can you understand me? That's the difference in listening to a transient and a resident. They're two completely different languages. And while they'll recognize it as language, what we don't know is are they understanding one another? When JK and L speak, it's very similar to if I drop into my true roots and go, hey y'all, you'd know that I just <laughs> said hello, but I am Southern and that's a twang. If we're in the Northeast and I say, I'm going to park the car in Harvard Yard, you know that I'm going to park my car in Harvard Yard, but it's a very soft R. Um, if I'm in Rhode Island and I'm thirsty and I go to bubble or to get a drink, you know that that's a local dialect for a water fountain because the water bubbles up. So it's very similar with JK and LPOD. <clears throat> they learn those calls from one another. They share them. They mimic each other. And as members, um, as the population dynamics change, new calls leave. New calls are introduced and some calls leave. Um, so we know that some calls are specific to a time and place, sim similar to groovy and things that we've said over time that may not be in our common dialect. And so that's how we got up to the JK and L. Um, and then, of course, they they found some new ones and we've had to go back into M up in the northern resident community. Um, as far as how they how they learned this fishing thing, um, it's, you know, to me, it's very similar to if you look at, if, if, if any of your people are birding, birders, and I'm going to suspect they are, um, it isn't something they've learned. It is how they're genetically adapted. It's what, it's what they've always done. If you look at a transient jaw, it is more robust and morphologically different than a Southern resident jaw because it's designed to crunch through the bones of an animal like a stellar sea lion. Salmon don't have the same structure. Residents um, can be very chatty as they're fishing because their prey don't use sound in the same way. Transients are very stealthy hunters because marine mammals, seals and sea lions use sound in a very similar way. Um, so when you look at birds, you would not expect your hummingbird to look at the feeder and go, wow, the nectar is gone. I'm gonna go over to the thistle sock and start eating seeds because they're not designed to be able to do that. Uh, you right. have a lot of birds in your yard that never come to the feeder because they don't eat seeds. They don't recognize that. They're looking for 
um, caterpillars or something else. Um, so it's a it's a it's a genetical it's a genetic difference. Um, and moms taught them we eat fish, and while it they could eat something else as a food source, that is not what they're designed to eat, and that's not what they're taught to eat. They're specialists. So when we look at that, then uh, our overfishing is obviously mm -hmm. a threat to. And we'll talk about some of the sound and other things that are threats to them, but. Um, Let's talk about salmon in the Pacific Northwest, which yeah. the salmon for some of the native cultures is the symbol of abundance. Yeah. And yeah. Um, unfortunately, it's not as abundant as it once was. Right. Yeah, we have a big problem with salmon in the Pacific Northwest. We have, we have a big problem with, with our planet. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but oceans um, and oceans have long been seen as you know, this giant vending machine that constantly replenishes itself. <clears throat> but the problem comes in with, in this region, we have over 8 million people that live in the waters that touch the watershed known as the Salish Sea, part of the home range of the Southern resident community. And so collectively, that's a huge impact is what I do doesn't necessarily make a difference, but if we're all doing the same thing, that builds up and it's a collective impact and we can choose for it to be positive or negative. But when I want to build my waterfront home and have no understanding or respect for what it might do to shoreline vegetation or grasses where salmon are rearing or other forage fish, um, if, if you don't take the ecosystem's needs into consideration, you're going to end up with this upside down problem of there's not enough for all of us if we manage it in a way um, that's not taking into consideration the ecosystem needs. Um, so it's it's not just the fishing, it's it's the chemicals you might put on your lawn to have beautiful flowers and green grass. Absolutely. It's the trees that you cleared yeah. and now the banks eroding or the stream that you cleared so that it had free flowing, but you've lost all the places for salmon to shelter as they're returning to their natal spawning grounds. Um, it's, you know, there's some beauty in looking at the natural cycles and the natural environment and figuring out how do we live into it, live into it rather than thinking that nature has intruded on our lifestyles. Yeah, and even the, I, it's, yeah, even, I, I think there, almost every little thing we do ends up in the water, whether it's the lotions we use, it's the chemicals yeah. we use in our house, everything we do yeah. is changing the pH of the ocean. Yeah, yeah. And, and as for native communities, um, as you mentioned, I, I mean, I just want to stress that the answer isn't stop fishing and stop eating fish. It's figure out how to consider the needs of the ecosystem and make sure that in times of scarcity, we take less to leave more for others. It's, you know, I've, I've heard seen stories of salmon runs that are getting ready to go extinct. And, and I actually read a quote in the paper of, some fishermen that said, well, then we better go fish it and get the last one because we want to be able to get that fish before they're all gone. That's not the answer. No. To me, it would be figured out how to give them the best possibility to return to spawn so that you have eggs. I mean, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a group of salmon that are going to return every year. They're going to recreate. Just give them a chance to do that. And there may be years and there are years that we should be taking less to figure out how to leave more so that they can have a chance to replenish. Um, but if, if we stop fishing, um, you know, part of what happens, and we've seen this a lot with habitat for, for birders, is you have to develop consensus and you have to build cooperations with all user groups so that everybody has a vested interest in seeing it be saved. So it's invite all the voices to the table and as uncomfortable as that can be, build consensus, figure out what the win-win is, not just for the humans, but for the ecosystem and the species that we're, we're all interested in. Um, and being voices for and to communicate with. That is so, I mean, th that again, it's like, if we all could just communicate. Yeah. I mean, it's it's funny that we, we struggle with communicating with animals because we're, we, we can't even do it with each other. Yeah. Otherwise we would have figured this out. Um, what uh, And then there's another big threat to the ecosystem there and that's, um, the the Juan de Fuca Straits is a pretty big shipping canal. Oh yeah, and so we all our goods come in from <clears throat> the Pacific, and uh, cars and stuff 
that we need as consumers that we desperately need. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so that, and that changes the sound for the whales. Yeah, it does. And, um, you know, there are a lot of people who think you really do need a lot of those things. So. Um, but it's so if so, so to put in context for people and I and I saw in the chat that uh, somebody is an adopter of Kiki, yay, J53. Yes, you can symbolically <laughs> adopt an orca um, and mm -hmm. join a tribe of people who support those orcas. So the, the orca is not going to show up at your house and that's going to not going to live in your swimming pool and ask you to feed it. It's an emotional support and it's a program that helps us continue education and outreach as well as our research projects. So one of our projects is acoustics and that's listening to the underwater sounds to try to characterize the sound map and the place of what the Southern residents need. So to give you some context in the Southern resident community, we now have 74 members. Um, that's about the number where they were when they were listed. Uh, so we're, um, while we get a new calf, we're not gaining ground on recovering this population. They're not sure exactly what a recovered number would be, um, but there's pretty good consensus that it's over 120. Uh, so we're a long way, there, we're a long way away. This is a very long lived population or it can be when it has every um, strategy uh, for success. So plenty of food, clean waters, quiet waters, um, less intrusiveness so that they have a chance to rest um, in training time with their young. But in the area where the Southern residents live, it's as far south as Monterey in California and as far north as Southeast Alaska and throughout the inland waters known as the Salish Sea, um, there in between Washington State and British Columbia. So if you are familiar with that region, what you're hearing me say is a lot of metropolitan areas. It's a very urban environment where they live. So San Francisco, Seattle, Vancouver, Washington, I sorry, Vancouver, BC, uh, Victoria, all of these places that are major shipping areas, the Columbia River, which is you know Portland, Oregon area, that's very metropolitan urban areas. So they've long been used to being around humans and having to navigate this urban environment. But it's increasing because we're increasing. Um, I used to be able to say there's about 100,000 people per whale with that 8 million number, but our numbers are growing and their numbers aren't. So it's more than 100,000 people per whale at this point. Um, so looking at the, so it is the sound map with shipping because it's a constant thrum um, our hydrophone streams live at csound.org, and we also have a webcam that streams live from our research station, which is out at um, the Lime Kiln Point State That's Park. That's so cool. Um, I have to so it's in a lighthouse. Taking the naturalist course is one of the best things I've ever done. Um, That's fantastic. Yeah, and I love that you can hear them. It's, yeah. It's the coolest. So what we're finding is that, and, and it's not just our research, it's other researchers have um, collabor or corroborated this, is that in the, in the times of noise, when the sound gets louder, their voices have to go up to be able to be heard over the noise. And there is a time when it gets so noisy, they just stop. So think about it, um, you know, right now you can hear us fine because the internet's working and yeah. we have microphones and headsets and everybody's on their own browser and you can adjust your volume. And if it gets too noisy, you can turn it off. But if you're at a cocktail party or a sporting event or some, your family picnic, you remember those when we all used to gather in person and it would get really noisy. And what do you do? You raise your voice and you extend your call to be heard over the noise because you can't whisper and be heard in that environment. And our whales are doing the same thing. It's known as the Lombard effect. So what we're trying to do is figure out for the shipping is there a rate of speed that if you reduce the speed of a ship coming through, does it reduce the sound that's received by the animal? And we're finding that that is the case. Uh, the project started out of Vancouver with the Port of Vancouver. It's called ECHO, E-C-H-O. Uh, we're starting a new one now. Um, huge, lots of partners on this. So when I say we, there's this huge group mm, um, that, that have joined together to do this. Um, it's called Quiet Sound, and they're going to be doing the same thing for the Seattle and Tacoma port. Uh, the shipping that heads down south to try to figure out how to, to to reduce that level of noise and to work with the shipping industry. Uh, it's very international. It's very complicated. They have to have a pilot that navigates them in. All of them are unionized, uh, so they can't take too long to do it because then they have to stop and get a second pilot. It's very complicated. And what's been cool is hundreds of shippers have signed on voluntarily to try this out. Um, and we're finding that it's That's making really a difference. Cool. That's really Lots of other cool. boats to work on. 
yeah, lots of other boats to work on. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's an area. The San Juans have over 400 islands. Four of those are served by the Washington State Ferry System because you can't get here by car. You can only get here by boat, boat or plane. So ferries are a way of life out here. Uh, but they too want to work on this. Uh, we're we're working on another project uh, that's a real time alert for mariners uh, to avoid vessel strikes on whales. Um, and the ferries have been a lead on that project because there have been some pretty unfortunate incidents that, that they are, aren't interested in ever seeing again. So they want to figure out how to avoid any negative interactions. So it's been really amazing to see all those different industries interested to see it get better. So there are people that are interested in making this better. Cause my, my question about Absolutely. the fishermen there is that Absolutely. a struggle to get people to listen to all of these yeah. things. It, it is. And it's understandable. I mean, I, I think of it right now when, um, you know, you mentioned the, the Ukrainian Russian conflict, if that's what we're calling it right now at the beginning of, you know, the different ways that we're all showing support and one is asking retailers to, ban and boycott the sale of Russian vodka. And we do that blindly and don't even look where it was actually produced or realize that it's already purchased. So who would be taking the hit is the retailer that now can't right. sell that, but they've already made the purchase. So the same thing happens when you do a unilateral decision like stop fishing is, okay, well, let's talk about that because if the fish is already in the, in the freezer, then now it's really gonna go to waste if we can't sell that at the grocery. So where you do is you start at that beginning before you make the decisions to remove things from the environment. Let's let's really do a good assessment to figure out what's available and how do we make sure that, that that's a run, that's a time that you can fish. Um, so where the defensiveness comes in is when you're really going after, you know, a single source. And I think back to the pandemic when so many restaurants were hit so hard is we asked yeah. them to take the hit, but but at the beginning didn't give them a way out. We didn't give them any kind of way to supplement that economic impact. And you have to look at that. If you really want people to buy in, you have to say, I recognize this is gonna be an economic impact for you. So much like they've done in the farming industry is they get a supplement to not farm that year. Great, <laughs> then figure out a way to replace that economic source for them so that they're now champions of helping to recover the system and aren't taking the economic hit for the rest of us. Cause it's not a, it's not a single source problem. It's a human problem. It's a huge human problem. Almost every single thing that comes down to extinction. And um, the other day when we had Linda Tucker on, it's like, it's not the actual poachers, right? Because that, that, that's coming from a socioeconomic need, right? right. right? It's the thing we have to look at is, how do we help these communities, whatever it is, whether it's the fishing community or in this, you know, the tribal community of a local indigenous group in South Africa from right. needing on that level? And that again comes back to, wow, what if we actually communicated? Yeah. And it's, you know, and give them an alternative. It's don't yeah. just take it away without telling them, because it's, a, you know, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, people are gonna want that food, shelter, water. Everybody, animals all want food, shelter, water. And if you say you can't get it this way, they've got to find a way to get that. It's, right. a, it's, a, it's a basic need of, of survival. Um, so it's really important to, to, to invite those voices as a part of the process. Cause you know, it's that same thing that if they're part of the decision-making then they're gonna be invested and they're gonna to wanna to see it succeed. But if you tell them what to do and them being whoever it is we're talking about, then then you're in a de defensive posture mode. And there's not a lot of conversation that happens once exactly. you start pointing the finger. Yeah, yeah. exactly. One, one thing that I think about now that we're talking about this is it's like the JK and L pod, I mean, they really model cooperation, <laughs> right? They're yeah. modeling exactly what we could be. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned Granny, and I too want to talk about Granny because Granny um, J2, uh, she was the matriarch of the Southern Resident Community, so she led all three pods. Uh, I saw, they I've first, seen her many times. Which yep, so she's an amazing, amazing girl. Um, but they first saw her when they did the census. So back during the capture, she was fo photographed several times when they were removing animals from this population for the aquarium trade, um, uh, for the entertainment industry. Lolita. Yeah. 
Yeah. But anyway. So, but Granny, but Granny was photographed, but she's never been seen with a calf of her own. And one of the things that we've learned about this community is they are one of, I believe it's six animal populations on the planet that the the adult females will go through menopause in a sense and no longer have calves. And a lot of animal populations, you know, that when when they reach the end of their child bearing years, they don't live much longer, but that's not true in the Southern resident community. It's not true with African with elephants and several other populations around the world. They become what we know as matriarchs. I think of them as wisdom keepers. Mm -hmm. um, so Southern residents are a matriarchal community. Uh, we not only know who the dads are through paternity studies, uh, through genetics, uh, because they're gonna travel with mom all their lives because why? Sorry to tell you, mom's in charge. Um, as far as we can see. So Granny led this community for more than 40 years uh, without a calf of her own. And she was estimated to be somewhere between 85 and 105 years old when she passed. Um, so still breaching, still doing all the display behaviors that whales do when they're excited about things that have nothing to do with us. Uh, they just, sometimes they just got to throw them, their bodies out of the water and it's amazing. And she could oh still God. do it near what the end of her throw? life. It was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so she was amazing. Yeah, um, and I would love to talk a little bit about <clears throat> Lolita, who's in Miami, was obviously one of the Alpod, right? Right, right. She was also photographed during the, so Lo Lolita is also known as Tokite. Uh, she was photographed during the capture era as well. Um, we don't have genetics on Lolita, so we don't know exactly who her, um, family members are, except for that she uses L-Pod calls. Uh, so yeah, since she so still uses them, and so since she still uses them and recognizes L-Pod calls, uh, there was a, a reporter decades ago that snuck in and did a playback. Um, and she swam to the side of the tank because she recognized oh L-Pod oh calls. Um, so she, she was officially listed um, as a member of the Southern resident community and recognized as an endangered whale uh, a few years ago. The People got super excited because we thought that meant, well, now they have to release her. But if you know a lot about zoos and aquariums, you know that there's precedence for having endangered animals in zoos and aquariums because there's concern that they're not going to survive in the wild. And they're trying to figure out how to save the species, so to speak. So there's precedence for her to stay in captivity. But there have been a lot of rumblings lately that there might be some movement on that front. Uh, so we're, we're all kind of in watch and see mode of what might happen with Lolita. And when I was up there, there uh, it seemed like there were places where uh, uh, somebody could be released and be safe and have salmon and hear their yeah. family. Yeah, it's a, um, it's a really complex issue because there are a couple of places that they've identified. Um, but the, the tragic thing about Lolita is, you know, I see it on a couple of levels. She was captured um, when she was very young. I mean, I'm trying to remember now exactly how old she was. And there, the people on, people on your call probably know exactly how old she was, but she's been in captivity uh, for more than 40 years. And I think she was captured when she was around five. So she's now postmenopausal, um, most likely postmenopausal. Uh, she would never have really had, so, so <clears throat> when orcas are born, they don't have teeth, they nurse her mom. And then somewhere around two to three years old, it's very similar lifespan to ours. They're gonna learn to catch fish and then they're gonna to have to fish on their own. She would have been right at that point of learning to catch fish when she was captured. Um, so one of the questions is how successful would she be? Um, right. She wouldn't be contributing to the increase of Southern resident community. There would be this whole reintroduction of having to help her understand family and culture. She's been living in you know a tropical environment for a long time. The Pacific Northwest is anything but tropical. It's right. 55 degree water. Um, so, so I think, yeah, so I think the consensus is she would never be wild again. She would never completely leave what, what we know as a net pen area that would give her much more space to be a, to be a wild whale and in natural environment and, you know, live out her days in natural waters, which would be a much better environment for her. But the question is, um, she wouldn't be able to, so the question is how would LPOD, JK, JK and LPOD respond and how much time would they actually spend in the area where she was or it would be, you know, periodic pacifies. We have no idea. Right. Um, the last time something like this was done was I think with Keiko. Um, I know, so, 
Yeah, so it's um, so it's really, really complex, but absolutely worth trying. Um, she's not, I mean, to, you know, the weird thing about Lolita is, you know, up until this point, she's been really healthy. And uh, her, one of her trainers did make kind of a camo appearance once to the Whale Museum to, to learn more about the Southern resident community. And I found out after they had been here that they were here, but just stood and sobbed um, as they were learning the story because they really love Lolita. They really want to care for her. And these are the trainers. I'm not, I don't know anything about the owners of the aquarium, but I know that right. the people that have cared for her really care for her. Um, so, you know, lots of interesting stories in the whale community. Luna is another one that we could talk about. Um, but what you see with them is in the few times that solitary socials have been watched is they find a way to build a new community. If you watch the story about Luna, which I think it's just made it to the big screen again, uh, Luna was in Nutka Sound and spent a lot of time every morning going around to all the boats, like helping the loggers tie the logs and helping the guy with the hose handle the hose. And, and as I watched Luna, it was almost like Luna was going around saying, hey, you guys need to gather up and get closer, almost like circling the pot every morning. Um, and it was really fascinating to watch um, when you think of it from that perspective of trying to build a new community. That is profound. Yeah. Oh. Well, I think it would be fun to hear some of the fun things about, like you were saying, that Granny could like boom, just mm. come out of the water like that. Um, well, what are some of the fun displays? So, so that's called breaching when they come completely out of the water. Um, to which I don't know if you can just see this one on the poster behind me. So that's a orca getting ready to do a, a side breach. Um, but they do, they do tail slaps, which is when they stick their back flukes, their tail flukes out of the water and their slap. We don't know if they're stunning fish or communicating, but there was one time I was watching that it was a K-5 matriarch. So on the west side of the island, uh, the bathymetry is about 960 feet deep. So the whale within 20 feet of shore. So the whales can come super close to shore. So I was watching them one day and she was headed south and everybody else was heading north. And all of a sudden she started tail slapping and I mean, boom, 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 she did it 20 or 30 times in a row. And I was like, what in the heck? And then I saw everybody turn around and head her away. And I was like, she was wow. like every mom going, it's time to go this way. You kids turn around we got to go. And they were like, yeah. no, hello. I'm going here. <laughs> so, uh, that, but it's so fun to watch them because I, I mean, I use this all the time, but I say we're, we're recreating, we're playing in their living room. So whatever yeah. they're doing, they're just living their lives. They're not putting on a show for us. They're yeah. living their lives and we have the honor to witness it. So it's when I, you know, when you go to grandma's house, would you jump on the couch? Unless grandma told you you could, you know, would you leave your trash behind? No, you're going to be respectful of that space because you might get in trouble with grandma. But we should think of it the same way that when we're in the waters or in their hearing range, be as respectful as possible because we're in their living room. Uh, there was another time that I was standing by the lighthouse and I was down on one of the closest layer of rocks to the shoreline and I'm watching them and we had been doing lighthouse tours, but we paused lighthouse tours when the whales go by because we don't want anybody to fall off the lighthouse. And they were coming south again and I was just in awe because I had just moved out here and um, standing there on shore watching them. And all of a sudden Blossom, a J-16 and her calf at the time, veered over and she started doing the slow, not full spy hop, a spy hop is when the nose comes, all the rostrum comes all the way out of the water and they kind of do a look around. So she just kind of raised her nose up to get her eye above the water line. And she's kind of looking at me and she did it three mm -hmm. times. And I look in the distance and I see Ruffles who was the big bull at the time and ruffles, their dorsal fins get to be six feet tall. He had a very ruffled trailing edge. He was like coming at me 20, 35 miles an hour. I'm like, oh my God, if that whale comes any faster, he's going to come on shore and knock me over. And on the third time, she kind of went eh, and went under and swam off. And he veered with her. And the woman behind me said, wow, you just got your own personal spy up. And I'm like, huh. And I'm like catching my breath and I look down, I'm like, oh Lord, I'm wearing black pants, a white jacket and a black shirt. She wanted to know <laughs> what that whale was doing on shore and I better go on a diet. So it was amazing. <laughs> I've tried it again. The outfit does not work twice. 
Um, oh, but it was God, it awesome. was just amazing to think she recognized black and white on shore and wanted to know what it was doing there. It wasn't me. It was I looked like them, so and funny. but they're very curious and yeah, um, they're they I mean super huge brains, super complex uh, thinking processes. Uh, you know, I I'm not a researcher. I'm not a scientist. I'm just a person. So I can anthropomorphize all day long, but I really believe they have feelings and oh, I believe they have strong family structures and I feel like they communicate other th than whether or not there's a fish around. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Oh, well, I'll never forget that, that whale coming under the boat. I mean, that was like yeah. one of the most thrilling moments of my life. Yeah. Looking right at me the whole, th I've got photos of that just beautiful eye. Just yeah. So curious. Yeah. My favorite is when they breathe, when they come to the surface and it's just such a powerful. So as they breathe, the air is going to come up and disperse the water that's at the surface. And it's just this powerful. Yeah. That's my favorite. And I just sound. stand there and listen to that all night long. It's just, it's just so calming. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. And I think it's, interesting that um uh i love that you have a an artist background so to speak so how does that how did you come to want to do this with the whales from mm. how did you make that transition so i'm um all right i already gave it up i'm i'm southern so i grew mm -hmm. up in florida and texas and tennessee but spent most of my uh years in florida and uh, started out doing nature photography in the intercoastal there on the east coast of Florida around uh, in Brevard County. So um, Melbourne, Rockledge, Cocoa right. Beach, that I've region. West and, Palm area at one point. Yeah. So you were the home of the Hanging Chad. We were exactly. north of you. I yeah, we were north. You were there. Broward. We were Brevard. So we were up north. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I just I loved uh, my favorite species there was the alligator. Uh, but I also did a lot of photography with uh, the bottlenose dolphin and manatees. Um, and our closest, you know, when you're in, you know, this from Broward is you're in the shadow of Disney World. And so we were one of the first families to go to Disney World. And it was so fun. It was this theme park. And then this thing, SeaWorld, opened up. And I thought, oh, well, that's the more natural park. And I am being a more evolved human to go somewhere that's focused on live animals until I found out that you could see these whales in the wild. And I came out here and it was a super foggy, socked in day. And the boat captain was like, I don't know if we're going to see anything. Uh, we were coming from the mainland, so it took us over an hour to get out here. People got off in this little town called Friday Harbor to shop, and I'm like, what's wrong with you? There could be whales. <laughs> so we went on around the backside of the island, and the fog kind of started to lift, and we saw K-pod in resting formation. So when whales sleep, they can't shut their brain all the way down and go to sleep like we do. They have to keep half their brain awake because it's an involuntary breather. They have to remind themselves to breathe, so they have to come to the surface to take that breath, and if they don't, um, they'll asphyxiate or drown. So they were in resting formation. So what they do is they group up and they're traveling in this very tight group. And we think that one or two stay a week to kind of act as the sentry of, uh oh, you know, it's time to wake up and move on. But they just slowly roll and breathe at the surface. So all we saw was this large group of whales breathing. And they were probably 600 to 750 yards away. I only had a little pocket camera because this was back before everybody had a cell phone. They they didn't have cell phones at a point. I don't know if everybody knows that, but this is not an all-time invention. It's a new thing. Um, so I just used my little Instamatic, and I got these pictures of these little tiny black tri triangles. And everything in my being settled down and said, you're home. And for somebody who grew up um, in a divorced family and moving constantly and having to do child custody to go back and forth between parents, I never felt that before. And I'm like, I'm in it. I might cry, Joan. I'm in an area where I've never been before. And everything in my being just said, you're home. And I really didn't know what that meant. It took me 12 years to move here. Um, but as a nonprofit manager, the museum needed a nonprofit manager at the time. I just finished a degree and was in a place that I could make a move and was coming here on vacation. So I offered, I said, I'm already coming. Do you guys want to interview? I'll submit a resume. And here I am 15 years later, <clears throat> 16 awesome. since I'd interviewed, but, um, but it was because of seeing this space and realizing that where I had always seen whales in this awesome 
you know, environment where they were cared and cared for and fed at SeaWorld, it would be like asking you to live in your bathtub the rest of your life. Yeah. And when I came out here and saw that this was just their summer range, I've never been able to go back to a, to SeaWorld or a marine park again um, and realize that if there's anything I can do to speak on their behalf in places where they don't have a voice to try to make it better for them and not just them, you have to look at the whole ecosystem. You can't just pick out one part and only focus on that because the whole thing is interconnected from sea floor to sea sky. You have to care about you have to care about barnacles, you have to care about slugs, you have to care about grasses and seaweeds, you have to care about forage fish and uh, dabbling ducks and diving ducks and gulls and eagles and deer on the shore. You have to care about all of it. We can't keep thinking that it's all here for our entertainment because really the best thing we can do with our two hands, our two feet, our mouths, our eyes, our ears is figure out how to serve them. Absolutely. That's so profound. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> what are some things that people can do at home other than adopting whales? Ah, well, so adopting whales would further our work, right? So that, that and that helps us with um, continuing our work. But the other thing that it does is it gives you some really cool pictures and a genealogy chart to start um, really wowing your friends with your whale knowledge. I, I used to get teased by people that I worked with before I moved here. They're like, why are you studying a page of black triangles? And I'm like, because I'm trying to learn their dorsal fins. Uh, but you'll get this really awesome packet and, and we do a monthly update. So the one, um, I've got to proof it when I get off this call, that'll go out to all of our orca adopters and to tell them what's going on with the whales. Orca adopters get to help nominate names for whales like with the exception of those in Samish's line. Um, and then we do a public vote so you can help um, the scientific new, uh, Alphanumeric comes from researchers, but the more common name like a blackberry or a kiki comes from us. Um, and we can all help name those whales together. Um, so that's one thing that you can do that helps further the work of an organization that's trying to collectively, you know, garner bigger support. A um, couple of things that you can do, uh, there's super tiny things like pay attention to how you shop and what you eat. Um, you know, I love Barbara King Solver's uh, book Animal Miracle v Vegetable when she talks about eating within a 100 mile radius, eating within season. Um, no, you should not be able to get strawberries year round unless you have a hot house. Um, but just, you know, eating in season that also makes it more exciting when you eat of, wow, I can think of new things and I can try new stuff. And um, plastics, reducing plastic use. Uh, it's It's becoming mandated now, but take your own bags wherever you shop and, you know, using canvas bags or compostable bags. Stuff like that is big. Um, and if we are all doing that together, it collectively makes a huge impact. If you are also wearing a mask and it's a reusable, please don't just throw it on the ground, put it in a trash can. We also ask people to remember to always cut any loop of plastic because that can be a restriction uh, for an animal when it gets it over its beak or down its neck. And we're, uh, we run the stranding network, so we look for um, uh, animals, marine mammals that have uh, issues like, like entanglements and those plastic packing straps that come on boxes and on six packs are a huge problem because it gets over their necks or over their beaks. So always cut a loop of plastic. Uh, don't let that go back out. It takes it forever to degrade in the environment and trash does get away from, you know, appropriate sources too. Mm -hmm. Another big thing you can do is vote with your dollar. So pay attention to what you're consuming and what you're supporting and if you think it's going to have a negative impact on something you care about, don't spend your money on it. Um, vote with your dollar. Um, if you are so inclined to be a little bit more political and talk to your elected officials on every level from, you know, local government to state government to federal government, all of them are making decisions that impact your environment. Uh, one area is parking lots. Everybody has a parking lot. But if you look at what parking lots are paved with, it's only things that are going to heat up the planet. So if we're looking at pervious pavement that has like, you know, little holes in it where grasses can grow through, that gives the, the stormwater a chance to filter down through before it hits the marine environment. But it also it gives the, the, that area a chance to stay cooler. Um, it's, you know, it's always remarkable to me to look at the weather in a place like Seattle versus the San Juan Islands. And there definitely is a concrete impact on rising temperatures. 
Yeah. Uh, so looking at things like that and talking to your elected officials about what's important to you and asking them to put that to the vote when they're making decisions on municipal codes or in endangered species. It, it all makes a difference. This has been absolutely amazing. And we're going to continue the conversation with you again, for sure, at some point. Sure. And, um, and I'm going to be up there. Oh, I just lost Joan. And did I go or did Joan go? And I can't hear your audio, audio, Claudia. So can your viewers still hear me or am I gone? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. So, so not if your viewers can still hear me. Okay, so Claudia is nodding that you guys can still hear me. Um, and a couple of you had said thank you. I have to tell you, I'm super grateful to be with you. Um, I've been a big fan of the work that Joan is doing. I am enrolled in one of her classes right now. Um, I have six she can't feral. Hear me. I can hear you now, Claudia. Um, I have six feral cats in my own home that I have rescued, and I have really need to talk to the mama cat. She's living in the closet, and she still isn't confident that I'm a trusted human, even though the food shows up every day. Um, so super excited about becoming part of this community and getting to know all of you. If you are interested in learning more about how you can help, we have some other things on an FAQ page on the Whale Museum's website, which is whalemuseum.org. And you, you can look there, but there's also lots of educator resources. So if you're homeschooling or just have things you want to do with your kids and your family at home, you can find all kinds of resources there. Uh, we've put up some extra stuff during the pandemic when there were so many virtual things. Uh, the marine naturalist class that Joan talked about is getting ready to run again, and we are going to run it all virtual one more time. Uh, so you can participate from anywhere on the planet. Uh, we have a nature journaling community. So if you like to sketch and write poetry, uh, we have another group that's exploring uh, love for the natural environment through creative processes. Uh, that's called the Salish Sea Nature Lovers or Snail. Um, so lots of different ways to get involved. And if you are ever in the, the Seattle area, Please take about two hours and head north to the San Juan Islands and uh, say hello. But I thank you so much for the time and being able to be with you all. I, I appreciate you and your love for our planet and our animals. I can see Claudia's lips moving and I can't hear her again, but I think she's getting ready to hang up on all of us. Um, Claudia, do you want me to stay for questions and answers or no? Because I can. No Q&A? Okay. No Q&A. There's Joan. Oh, hey. Joan's back. Yay! Hooray. Okay. Uh, I cannot thank you enough. That was absolutely amazing. Well, thank you so much for having me. I was just telling your group that I've just been a huge fan of your work for, for a number of years, and I have just started my first class, and I'm excited to become more of a part of your community. Thank I'm getting you. Ready to, I'm getting ready to talk with your horse. Oh, goody. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, it's been so wonderful, and I cannot say enough about the naturalist course. Um, that that is. Are you doing it this summer again? I was just sharing with them that uh, what well, the next one is in the spring, um, and the dates are already up on our website. And we're going to run it fully virtual one more time. So wherever they are on the planet and whatever time zone uh, they can participate because we'll also record the sessions. Uh, we've had folks participate that it's, you know, we're running them and it's eight o'clock in the morning here and it's three in the morning there. So they watch them later, but, um, but we're gonna do it fully virtual this spring. Oh, I might have to repeat. I might have to sign up with you. I think, yeah. I think you'd like it. I think you'd enjoy it. It's been really, I've, I've actually found that the virtual affords an opportunity that of community that can't make it to the San Juan Islands, but we can also build community in different ways. Um, so it's I've I've really enjoyed the virtual ones too. I mean I yeah. I like the tactile, but I like the virtual. Yeah, yeah. So come yeah. on, well, come I on and join it's us. Funny because we found that too with our hybrids, right? Like some in person. Yeah. It's like wow, there's so many more people coming. But, yeah. Well, and you don't have to. So so the in person is limited to a bus size. 
And it's a really big bus right. on the internet. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, more fun to come. And I'm going to be up in the Pacific Northwest in June. So I will be, um, my uncle. That's why we lost you as I was like, yay, I get to see you yeah. again. Yeah. Okay. I'm coming up. All okay, right. Good. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joan. Thanks, Claudia. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.